Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, well, welcome everybody coming out and uh, to listen to Yuri's talk. Um, I'm Christian Bird. I have the opportunity of hosting Yuri Brun today. Um, Yuri Brun is currently an assistant professor at University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst. Um, he got his PhD at USC and then had a postdoc at, close to us, University of Washington, worked with David Notkin and Michael Ernst. Um, we've had some collaboration with him in the past, and uh, he's here today to talk to us about privacy and reliability in an untrusted cloud. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So I'm going to talk to you today about privacy and reliability in the cloud. And those of you who know my work um, will find that this is quite different from the work that you know. Most of you know me for uh, doing stuff with developers, helping developers do particular kinds of actions. What I'm going to be talking about today is how do we eliminate whole classes of actions developers have to do from the set of things that they have to do. So I'm going to be coming up with a technique that tries to inject privacy into systems and try to inject reliability into systems without the developer worrying too much about how to do that. Okay? So let's jump right in. I'm going to start talking about privacy first. So let me just go ahead, jump right in, and talk about what I mean by privacy in the cloud. So the cloud is, is a well-known term today. There's lots and lots of things out there uh, that calls itself the cloud. And the problem that I foresee with the cloud is the following. If I used to do my taxes, I used to get my computer, I would, enter, I would download a program onto my computer, I would enter stuff into this program. And if I wanted to make sure that nobody stole my private data, what I had to do is make sure that nobody broke into my computer and stole the data, or nobody physically stole my computer. Now today, that's not the case. If I want to do the taxes, I don't, or I rarely download a program to my computer. What I really do is I go to something like TurboTax.com, and I enter my data into this program. And it's not stored on my computer, it's stored somewhere else out there in the cloud. Right? And so now I have to worry about two things. First, I have to worry that nobody breaks into uh, Intuit's cloud. Intuit is the company that makes TurboTax and steals the data. Uh, but second, I don't actually even know where these computers are. I don't know if Intuit is outsourcing this to some other cloud. And actually, these computers live on Azure or somewhere else. And so what I would really like to do is I'd like to make sure that the data that I'm entering isn't known even by those computers themselves. So I would like to distribute a computation onto a cloud or onto just some large network without having those individual computers know the private data that I'm entering into the computation. Right? I'd like someone to do work for me without them knowing what they're doing. So that's the problem I'm going to try to tackle today. So there's lots of different ways that I could try to talk to you about what does uh, privacy mean. I'm going to focus on a particular thing. Today I'm going to tell you about a technique called style. And it's a technique for privately solving computationally intensive problems. So I'm not going to look at taxes. I'm not going to look at Gmail. I'm going to start out with NP-complete problems. In particular, I'll talk about 3SAT. And I'll talk about how do we solve an instance of a 3SAT problem on the cloud without the computers on the cloud knowing that input, knowing the particular formula that I want to solve. And in particular, this is, um, this is an even harder problem than taxes because there's a very small input. Right? There's a, not, not just hard, I see some nods in the audience. It's not just harder because it's NP hard. It's harder from the point of view of privacy as well. So there's a very small input, and a lot of computation has to happen on that input. And I'm going to try to keep that input private, despite the fact, you know, in taxes, maybe you have to add a number somewhere and then never deal with that number again. It might be easier to keep it private. So the hope is that uh, if you can do it for NP complete problems, you can expand it to a much wider range of problems. All right, so how are we going to do this? Well, it turns out this is a hard problem. And in fact, uh, there's lots of people working on this problem. Uh, those of you in the audience who are familiar with homomorphic encryption, it tries to solve exactly the same problem I'm trying to solve. The idea is you have lots of computers. You want to distribute a computation onto computers without them knowing what they're doing and give you back an answer that you can actually use, but they don't know what the answer is. So I'm going to make a circum uh, circumvent the problems that people have identified. So in particular, so. Uh, Childs in 2005 has proven that, uh, proven that for a certain kind of problem, it's actually not possible to get help from somebody else without telling them what the problem is and what your input is. Right? And he showed that for NP-complete problems. So how am I going to get around it? This is what I'm doing. I'm going to take a problem, and I'm going to distribute it into lots and lots of computers. Now, it's going to be the case that if you look at all the computers, if you were to compromise all the computers, altogether, they're going to know my data. 
But if I look at any one computer, or if I look at any several computers, and I'll show you later that as long as I don't control up to half of the network, it's very hard to reconstruct the whole input. Right? So that's how I'm circumventing these hardness proofs from before, is that it is the case that the whole cloud is going to know my, my data. But if you look at reasonably large chunks of the cloud, they won't. And so it provides these uh, guarantees. Right, so in particular, the, uh, I'll come back to homomorphic encryption later in the talk, but in particular the distinction is that the privacy guarantees are weaker than with homomorphic encryption because the entire entity would know their computation, but it is, uh, it's a systems approach. It is a much more efficient approach than homomorphic encryption is today. Now I think very highly of homomorphic encryption and I think that uh, a decade from now we'll all be using it, hopefully, uh, but today uh, this is a much more efficient approach. All right, so how do we get there? What we're going to do is I'm going to take a computation and I'm going to divide it into its very basic, very elemental pieces. We'll talk about how you do that. And then I'm going to take these pieces, the subcomputations, and distribute them in a smart way on the network so that they all sort of self-assemble, self-compute, and everything comes together and out pops the answer for you. Right? That's the high-level approach. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to describe to you um, a theoretical model of how do you take a problem and separate it onto little pieces. So let's talk about a particular theoretical model. So here's an example of a model. You need um, an input to this computation, and I'll talk about each one of these pieces on the next uh, few slides. You need an input that you can encode in some way, and I'm going to encode things using these tiles, these little squares with labels on them. You can think of them kind of like cellular automata. And then you need a program that in some way acts on the input. So here's a program that happens for addition. Again, I'll talk about that in a second. And then in this view of, of computation I'm talking about, you take an input that encodes your input, you take a program, you mix them together, there's lots and lots of copies of this program, and these little pieces are going to self-assemble and somehow build up a large, what I call crystal, an assembly of these tiles that encodes the answer. So that's what it means to compute. Okay, so let's go through this uh, in detail, this example, so you understand what I'm talking about. So first of all, I want to talk about the program. The program for addition, here's an example of a program. This is the hard part. This is the part you have to write using tiles to perform the particular calculation that you're interested in. So this program is for addition. And we don't have to understand too much of how this works, but you can sort of see that it, um, each one of these tiles encodes information, encodes bits. There's zeros, there's ones. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a hint as to how this works. Each one of these tiles is a one-bit full adder. So this tile right here, it's adding 0 and 0 and 0. And it's coming up with the answer is 0. And the carry bit is 0. I mean, not very interesting. If we take a look at one of these guys, it's adding 1 and 0 and 1. And in binary, 1 plus 1 plus 0 is 0 with a carry bit of 1. OK, so we'll, we'll see how this uh, comes together in the future. Let's take a look at what we're going to do with these tiles. Let's take a look at an input. So suppose I want to add 10 and 11. So let's encode 10 in binary. That's 1, 0, 1, 0 and 11 in binary, 1, 0, 1, 1. You build something like this. This is an input to the computation. So here is uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, the 10 encoded on top. Here's the 1, 0, 1, 1 encoded on the bottom. And now what's going to happen is we're going to look through this program, and these tiles are going to attach under certain rules. Here the rule is whenever a tile matches on three sides with this uh, crystal, with this growing assembly, it will attach. So there's one place here where there's three labels that are uh, available for attachment, the 001. So the 001 tile is going to attach there. Right, we're throwing it in here. And now what you see it's done is it's added this bit and this bit and this incoming zero carry bit. And so it said, okay, zero plus one is one. So it's added the two least significant bits and the carry bit from one from that is zero. So then the next thing you'll do is you'll add this 101, 101 right here is gonna pop in and you can fill it in all the way in there. And now if you read in the middle, you get 10101 which is 21 in binary. Right, so this is a very simple example. I'm just doing this full adder. Uh, but I'm trying to illustrate how this, you can take a computation, break it up into these tiny little chunks. All right, so now we, we can do this. Everything I've described so far is in this crazy model. It's, in a, it's a model. It's not in a software system. So what do I envision doing this with a software system? Well, I envision that each one of these tiles is going to deploy it on some computer. All right, so there's going to be computers out there. We'll talk about how they're out there. And, uh, they're going to deploy these tiles. And so you can envision that every single one of these things is deployed on a particular computer. And now if you come to the system and you compromise some computers, let's say we've compromised this guy, this guy, and this guy, we get pieces of the input. We get pieces of the output. We get pieces of the intermediate computation. We're sort of getting these chunks. An entity that controls these three computers can get these pieces, but all they see is a few bits. 
And I'll, I'll talk a little more about this later, but they don't actually even see that this one and this one are apart. So they, all they know is that they're not connected. They know these guys are connected. They can connect pieces that are directly connected, but as soon as there's a disconnect, you can't piece it back together. So in order to regain the whole input, you have to piece together through maybe you have multiple copies of this uh, addition going on at once, you have to piece together all the pieces. So that's where the hardness is going to come from. Okay? So this is a very high level intuition. Now, so far I've been talking about addition. The same thing you do with addition, you can do with more complex problems. Right? Addition was just for uh, explanation purposes. So with addition, you take, a tie, uh, you take a way to encode the input, and you can build something that will automatically find the answer for you. You can do the same thing with satisfiability. So here's a, a system that solves 3SAT. Now, you don't, this is way too small to read, so you don't need to read that. Um, and I'm not actually going to focus today on how the 3SAT tile system works. I want to focus today on how the software system that distributes it works. So, but I encourage you to take a look at the natural computing paper if you want to see how this works. But the idea is you encode the 3SAT formula using these tiles. And then there's a program. It's very similar to the addition program that I've written. Uh, instead of eight different tile types that addition had, it has 64 different tile types. And so then these tile types can come in and they attach and they grow and they find the right um, answer to the problem. Now, this is an NP-complete problem. And something that's important to understand is I'm not trying to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. All I'm doing is I'm trying to put NP-complete problems out on the cloud to solve them faster, but I'm not looking for polynomial time algorithms. So this algorithm is non-deterministic. It's going to guess an assignment. It's, it's not the dumbest non-deterministic algorithm. It's not going to guess two to the n assignments. It does 1.7 something, something, something to the nth assignments uh, because it makes some smart choices along the way and it can prune things along the way. So tiles are Turing universal. You can implement any algorithm you want using tiles, but that's really the hard part of the approach. And what I'm trying to, uh, to talk to you about today is let's say we go through the trouble of implementing our code, and, and there's actually you can compile it. You don't have to actually write with tiles. But let's say we go through the trouble of converting our programs to this crazy tile assembly mode. If we do that, what can we get out of it? Right, and the answer is privacy, but uh, it's at the cost of efficiency, at the cost of a couple of other things, so that's what we're trying to compare. All right, so the same thing that happens in addition, you can do with uh, NP-complete computation. You encode the input, you have to make lots of copies of the input now because it's non-deterministic, and then each one of these assemblies kind of grows. I'll show you the process of that happening, and then eventually there's this black tile in the corner. If the black tile attaches, that indicates that it's found the answer. It's found a particular assignment that will lead to the satisfiability of this formula. Um, if the assembly can also get stuck somewhere in the way, and if it gets stuck, then the black tile will never attach to that assembly. And that's going to happen to most assemblies. Right? There's only a few special ones that find the answer. OK, so how does this process actually work? When we're dealing with computers, the idea is the first thing you do is you go up to a network and you want to uh, make this network deploy your style computation. You have to tell the computers the program they're going to run. So you have to go out to uh, a computer and you have to say, you are going to be this type of a tile. You're going to deploy a particular type of a tile, which is uh, defined by those side labels that it has. And you go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And as I said before, there's 64 different tile taps for 3SAT. So you can take this system, and now, using some gossip protocols, they can spread this information out, and they can assign every computer on the network that's going to participate in your computation to a particular tile type. And then you build a single seed. So you build one seed out of computers in the network that are deploying these tiles that are deploying each one of these individual tiles, and they know they're connected. And that's all you have to do as the client, and now the, the system is going to take over on its own. So the first thing the system is going to do is it's going to go out and create copies of these seeds. So it's going to go out, and it's going to find other computers that deploys the same tiles as itself. So each one of these tiles is going to go out and find another computer that deploys the same tile, and ask it to replicate itself, to create a copy of itself. So the seed is going to create copies out there, and then they uh, communicate with one another using these neighbors in order to create an exact connected copy to the seed. Right, so this isn't too, too tricky. You probably believe me if I said that. If I have an assembly of computers that know about their neighbors, they can go out and they can create a copy of another set of computers that are going to look just like them. OK. Once you have each one of these assemblies built, they're going to start growing. So each one, without waiting for others to finish, is going to start growing. And under particular conditions, in this corner here, these two tiles are going to say, we need a neighbor. We don't have a neighbor. We have a couple of exposed sides here. We need a neighbor. So they're going to start querying nodes on the network to see whether or not they can attach. 
And when they do this querying, they're going to use secure multi-party computation protocols, so Yao's garble protocol. And the idea here is that when this node, when this tile tries to attach, it's going to learn two, only two things. It's going to, well, one thing. It's either going to learn that it can attach there or that it cannot attach there. So it either matches on the sides or it doesn't. It's not going to learn any of those bits of data that's stored within each, side, each one of the tiles. All right, so you only learn the interfaces. And that's how you prevent information from spreading. OK, so maybe this guy doesn't fit. I'll ask somebody else. Somebody else does fit. Uh, there's an intricate algorithm in there to make sure that you don't end up asking too many nodes. You can pretty quickly find out whether anyone fits or not. And so once the nodes start fitting, this assembly is going to start growing. And so there's uh, multiple levels of parallelism in the system. Uh, first, there's lots and lots of, of these copies of these assemblies going in parallel, and those can be completely independent. And second of all, uh, each one of these little growth places, each time you have a, a step, you can have a tile trying to attach there as well. So lots of these things can happen in parallel. And then once this crystal grows, once you get to the end, so some lucky crystal will get one of these black checkmark tiles, and then that, check, uh, that tile can uh, contact back to the client and say, hey, I found the answer. And the idea of this, if you think about it, there's lots of these inputs that are going in parallel. And most of them um, are not finding the right answer. And the hard part about this problem is fishing out the one that is finding the right answer. This assembly here is encoding precisely the, the answer to your problem, precisely what the three sat assignment is to satisfy the formula. So once you get the right one with the right authentication, you can go, the client can go and they can find out what the assignment was. Um, with some NP-complete problems, all you really care about is whether something is satisfiable or not. It's sort of a binary decision. So then you don't even have to disassemble this crystal. You just get that bit. Yes? Does the algorithm backtrack if you say, oh, this tile goes here, and then later you realize, oh, there's no answer? Right. Can it backtrack? So that's a good question. Um, the question is, does the algorithm backtrack? And um, in this particular implementation, it doesn't, because what's happening here is that you have lots and lots of copies of the seeds, and they're exploring all the possible paths. Now, you could implement something smarter where it actually does backtrack. It goes up, it gets stuck, things fall off. Um, there's some implementations of system like this, um, not in computers, but actually in DNA, where it does precisely that. But for this purposes, I didn't bother. I just sort of created uh, lots and lots of copies, and they're all exploring different paths. And the goal here isn't efficiency. And we'll see that in later slides, that the system is not super efficient. It turns out it's efficient enough to be used today for some purposes. Uh, but the key is that you can actually get really good privacy. And this is kind of a proof of concept of that sense. All right. So this is how you report uh, the answer to the client. So what I'd like to do now is I I've tried to give you some intuition about how the system works. I really want to talk about uh, a copy of the system that I actually built and talk about some empirical evidence, of uh, empirical evaluation of that system. Before we get to the empirical parts, first I want to talk about where does the privacy come from? Why is it hard to break the data, to uh, crack the data in the system? All right, so let's talk about the formal proofs of privacy. Before we get to the formal proofs, pretty graph. So for three different sizes of problems, for a 20-bit, a 38-bit, and a 56-bit input, what I'm showing here is as the fraction of the network you can compromise increases, so here you've compromised half of the network, what's the probability that you can crack the data? And so there's a few things to notice on here. One is that the bigger your problem is, the harder it is to reconstruct all the data. Right? And that's a good thing. You want that because for small toy problems, maybe it's easy to reconstruct all the data. But as soon as the problem gets into some real space where it's, it's a media problem, it actually becomes harder to reconstruct the data. Uh, another thing to notice is that as you come over here towards one half, if you compromise half of the network, there is, uh, asymptotically, you get 1 over e, uh, 1 minus 1 over e, or a 63% chance of being able to get the data out of the system. Right, so that's not very good. I wouldn't be happy if my taxes had a 63% chance of being hacked. Uh, but as soon as you push over here to the point 0.2 or point, uh, 0.1, so 10%, let's say, of the network is compromised, the probability of, of hacking the data is very low. So if you have a 56-bit input at 10%, you're getting 10 to the negative 40th, roughly, probability. So very low, right? And that's the exponential drop-off that you want. Um, so let's take a look at where these graphs come from. So first of all, what is my threat model? In this threat model, I assume Byzantine nodes that are trying to actively collude with one another in order to figure out the private data. And so you can figure out the probability they co uh, can collect enough pieces of all the different inputs that are floating around to put back together your entire input. And so there's three arguments here. There's the fraction of the network you've compromised. 
there's the size of your input. The larger your input, the harder it is to put together. But because this is an NP-complete problem, the larger your input, the more seeds you'll need, the more copies of the input will you need. And in fact, that number is exponential in the number of, in the size of your input. So you get this kind of, ugly, well, it's a very pretty formula, but it's a very uh, ugly interaction. You get this fraction here that's being exponentially pushed down by the size of your input, but then it's being doubly exponentially pushed up in the number of inputs that, so that you can collect different pieces from. And so in the end result, what you get is that graph that you saw. It's best, I think, uh, shown with an example. If you have a TerraGrid, a 100,000 machine network, and somebody has compromised 12,500 machines of that network, and you deploy, what am I using here, uh, a 17 variable formula, so a pretty small 3SAT formula, what you have is 1 in 10 billion chance that somebody can crack your input. And remember, as the formula becomes bigger, it becomes harder and harder to reconstruct that input. OK, so that's what I wanted to say about privacy. Let's talk about, uh, can the system actually run? So I've built a version of the system. It's called Mahjong. Uh, it's available for download. It's open source. I encourage you guys to use it if you'd like. It's actually uh, reasonably small. It's built on top of Prism MW, which is this middleware platform that takes care of all the network communication. And really, all uh, that Mahjong does is it imposes the rules for when things can and cannot attach. So it's only about 3,000 lines of Java code. Um, the input to the system is an NP-complete problem instance, and it compiles that NP-complete problem instance down to a distributed system that you can now take and put on computers, and it'll run, it'll provide an answer for you to solve that problem instance, right? So in particular, it's limited right now to NP-complete problems because it translates them using a polynomial time encoding into either three set or subset sum, which are two uh, programs for which I've written uh, tile systems. And the key idea here is that when, the, when somebody wants to use the system, they never have to worry about tiles. Tiles are an underlying thing, just like assembly is, that the developer doesn't need to worry about. I'd like to provide for them a system that they can use if they want to prove the properties, the privacy properties of the system. Sure, they need to understand tiles. But if all they want to do is deploy a system privately, they don't need to worry about tiles. It's an automated compilation procedure that does it for you. All right, so I use this system to run it on three different networks. I have an 11 node private cluster, so imagine a graduate student in a room with 11 computers he set up. That was me a few years ago. Um, I also have an 186 node uh, USC high performance computing cluster. So this is 186 computers that are all in Los Angeles, uh, but there are two different locations in Los Angeles and they're pretty homogeneous. And then there's also an 100 node Planet Lab subset. So Planet Lab is about 1,000 machines. I have about 100 of those machines. So Planet Lab is this globally distributed system. There's computers all over the place. Different um, organizations can contribute two or three computers to it for the rights to be able to use some of these computers to run as, as a test bed. Right. So Planet Lab is actually not an ideal resource for this particular computation because Planet Lab is not computation intensive. There's lots and lots of experiments running on it. It's very overloaded. So Planet Lab is really for measuring the reality of the Internet's communication um, overhead and things like that. But I think that for us, for me, it's really served as sort of this is the limiting factor. This is pushing style to the limit. Where you're using computers, some of them are overloaded and doing other things, and some of them are faulty and uh, might be running viruses. So I think it was a good evaluation from that point of view. All right, so what did I do with this? I wanted to show two things, to demonstrate two things by using these uh, systems. The first I wanted to show is that the system can actually be used. Because I'll, I'll show you something in a second that uh, fundamentally you should all be thinking this is going to be way too slow. Right? And then the second thing I want to show you is about scalability. So why is this going to be way too slow? Well, it's going to be way too slow because I'm taking things like, I'm taking, instead of even just adding two ints, I'm splitting it up into individual bits and I'm taking things that normally happen within gates within your CPU and I'm moving them to the network. Right? Grossly slow, 100, 2,000 times slower. In fact, uh, probably even this is an underestimate. Network communication is much slower than things happening inside the CPU. So this is, a, this is the right intuition, but it actually turns out that it's the right intuition for the wrong problem. The reason why this kind of slowdown doesn't affect style is the difference between throughput and latency. So if my system were doing the following, if it were saying, I need to add this bit and this bit, Great, let's take care of this tile. Sending a message out on the network for some tile to come and attach, which is essentially that addition. And then waiting for that message to come back. When the message comes back saying, great, you're attached. Let's go on to the next bit. If it were doing that, then in fact, this would be the right intuition. But it's not doing that. 
we're dealing with these very large computations with lots and lots of tiles. So my system never sits there and waits for communication. It deals with the tile, it sends out a message saying I need an attachment, and then it moves on to dealing with the next tile, and the next tile, and the next tile, and the next tile. So every single one of the nodes is spending almost no time, in fact, spending no time waiting for the communication to come back. In fact, the communication waits for the computation to, uh, for the, yeah, for the computation to finish on the nodes. So in particular, this is somewhere where uh, dealing with NP-complete problems helps me. There's just so much computation that you never end up waiting for the communication. Okay, so this is a nice little story that I told you, but I can actually verify this empirically. So what I did is I took an 11-node subset of the three networks, the private cluster with very low latency, the HPCC cluster, and the Planet Lab cluster, and I solved two different size problems on them, uh, the small one and the larger one, and you can see that there's never more than 6% uh, deviation from the mean. So, well, I can tell you it's 6%, but the, the times, despite the fact that Planet Lab has way bigger lag, the time doesn't change very much in the amount of time it takes to compute to solve the problem. Um, I also created a simulator to run my system on top of, and in the simulator I can control how much, it's a discrete event simulator, I can control how much uh, the communication takes. And so I used uh, no, no delay in the communication to 10, 100, and 500 millisecond, to also a Gaussian random distribution of the communication. And then also for every node, I assigned a random location on Earth, so somewhere in the middle of the ocean, but that's the world we live in today. And then I said the communication is going to be proportional to the distance. And again, you can see no more than 6% deviation from the median. So it's faster to go randomly around the error than to be totally local? Right. So, um, well, so it's not faster, the same way that the converse is not faster. Uh, there is lots of factors that, that affect your communication, the, the sorry, computation speed. Uh, and the most important one is that we're solving non-deterministic um, we're using non deterministic algorithm, so sometimes you'll get lucky, other times you won't get lucky. So it's not fast. I mean, here it's working out faster sometimes, but if I ran enough of these, all these numbers, the, the error bars would decrease. Basically, the latency is not effect, negatively affecting the running time is the key here. Okay, so that's the first thing that I want to demonstrate empirically. The second thing I wanted to demonstrate is that one of the big reasons I built this system is that I wanted to get good, um, good speed up, good scalability. So I want it to be the case that if I throw twice as many computers at my system, it would compute twice as fast. And there's so much parallelism here that uh, we should be able to get pretty close to that. So I designed an experiment to do that as well. Um, I solved some problems, again, a private cluster, HPCC, Planet Lab, and then also in simulation. And for each one of them, I picked a half of the network and then twi well, twice half of the network to compare how much the execution times were. And what I found was that I got 1.9 times speed up, so almost two, not quite, there's a little bit of overhead, uh, on the real physical network. And I believe that these numbers are pretty accurate for the physical networks. In simulation, there's a little more variability here. You can see I'm actually getting super linear speed up. Um, I think that this comes from the fact that I solved a very large problem. So this is a problem for where you can't explore all the seeds. We're really just exploring a small portion of the seeds. And so basically, the error bars are too big here. So this is really just an artifact. Uh, I think that the numbers that I got from the physical network of 1.9 are much more accurate. And the simulation just sort of shows that the algorithms do what you would think that they would do. Right? So this is not quite perfect. We're not getting twice the speed up. But I'm pretty happy with the 1.9 number, considering uh, it's not really optimized for that overhead. OK. So great. I want to talk a little bit about some related work and other ways to try to solve the same problem. Uh, so first thing, first and foremost, uh, if quantum computing were a real thing today, you could do private computing the way I've described it by using entanglement. So this is great. I look forward to the day when we can do quantum computing. Um, similarly, homomorphic encryption tries to solve the exact same problem. Uh, today, actually, Microsoft Research has done some great advancements in homomorphic uh, encryption. And there's certain uh, types of problems that we can actually do already. When homomorphic, first, uh, homomorphic encryption first came out, we needed more memory than all of our, probably than particles in the universe, in order just to solve a simple problem. Today, we can actually do some additions, some even multiplications using homomorphic encryption. Uh, but I'm really trying to target much larger problems that today are not possible with homomorphic encryption. So I fully believe that decade, maybe sooner, um, if we're lucky, we can use homomorphic encryption. Uh, but for now, I'm taking a systems approach to trying to solve the same problem that's actually usable today. Uh, there's lots of work out there on trying to distribute computation in a non-private way. And this work is complementary to mine because you can actually take these approaches and you can uh, compile them down into style and you will be trading off efficiency for privacy. So you'll be getting a private system out 
Um, some of them are trickier than others, but it, it's complementary in that sense. There's lots of work on uh, how to make systems fault tolerant, and I'll actually get to that next. We'll get to the reliable part of the cloud. And then there's also lots and lots of work out there on how to do private storage and private access to data on the cloud. Uh, and of course, the big difference here is that you could, for example, encrypt your data, but you can't then compute on it. You have to decrypt it to compute on it. And I'm really trying to get the cloud to compute on the data, produce something useful for me without, uh, uh, without telling them what you're doing. OK, so what I told you about in the first half of the talk is about style. It's this kind of crazy idea that we're going to get privacy through distribution. By distributing the problem, that's where we're going to get privacy from. And I've shown that this is actually possible. It's not very efficient, but it's actually possible to do. And I can give you a specific number. So in my not optimized prototype, it costs about 4,000 times more to solve the problem using style than on a single machine. So what that means is if I have, it's uh, roughly the cost of owning one machine, I could do it just as fast by owning 4,000 cloud machines, right? So that's a big difference. Uh, it's probably not, uh, financially doesn't make sense to do that right now. But I believe that about uh, half of that, or I should say the square root of that, about a factor 20, is because of inefficiencies in the prototype that I've built. And then the other square root of that has to do with the fundamental uh, cost of doing privacy by distribution. Right? So basically, the project can be increased quite a bit. And even, even with this 4,000 number, there's still places where people would want to use it. Uh, Microsoft has tons of computers that are internal to the company that are not being used at night. They may want to run something on them, but they may not trust those individual computers to not have spamware or something installed on them. So they may need to do it in a, in a private way. So um, there's places. And in particular, what I think about this as is this is a bound. This has shown an upper bound of we can do privacy through distribution by doing it this way, by doing it through style. Right? We can try to improve on it. We can try to build more efficient systems. This is orders and orders of magnitude more efficient than homomorphic encryption already is. Uh, but it, you know, it's a very different approach. All right, so I'll refer you to uh, a couple of papers, one from ICDCS from last year, and one from Transactions Dependable Secure Computing, if you want more information. OK, so I want to shift gears a little bit right now. And I want to talk a little bit about how do we make systems not just private but reliable? How do we take a system and try to make it more reliable without the developer having to worry about it? So I'm going to start out by asking you a couple of questions. So the first question is, let's say I want to compute some very simple function. I want to compute what 3 plus 5 is. And I can ask uh, you guys in the audience, but let's say some of you are Byzantine, some of you are mean, or maybe some of you are just faulty, and you may not give me the right answer. Let's. Thank you. Yes, that, that is a good example. Um, so let's say that there's a 70% chance that if I ask any one of you, you'll give me the right answer. But that 70% is not enough for me. So what's a good way for me to bring up that reliability? Ask multiple times or more or less. Right. Ask multiple. Ask three of you and have you vote. Or ask five of you and have you vote. Right. That's one possibility. OK, let me ask you a separate question. Let's say that I would like to send a message to Chris. Um, and in sending this message to Chris, the channel among which I'm going to send it is noisy. So let's say about 30% of the bids get flipped. So how can I send a message to Chris? Send it a bunch of times. Send it a bunch of times. Does anyone have another idea? So we know a lot about, uh, from information theory, about sending messages. We could do things like he could send me an acknowledgment. We could encode our message in a smart way, such that what we get back um, uh, sorry, such that we can correct errors, uh, or at least detect errors. And it's not sending the message multiple ways. We could send the message multiple ways, but that's not very efficient. So the question I want to ask is, if we know, in, in fact, there's lots of theory out there on how to optimally send a message, so that you're squeezing as much information as you can out of every non-noisy bit. So if that's what we do for sending information, why don't we do the same thing for computation? Can we improve our computation, computational channel, if you will, of the cloud, so that you're getting as much reliability as you can out of it? So it turns out you can. Here's the model that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, you have a pool of computers. The computers can be Byzantine. So the computers can be actively trying to collude and break your computation, uh, but not all of them. But the fraction and the identity of the nodes that are Byzantine is unknown to me. And in fact, it can change. Computers can join. Computers can leave. They can become Byzantine. They can become reliable again. All of that is, is unknown to me. All I know is that some fraction of them is faulty. And my goal is to build a technique called smart redundancy. So I'm going to try to use redundancy. And that redundancy is going to try to maximize the task reliability given a particular cost. So basically, let me say that 
I'm willing to spend three times the resources for my computation of, of just doing it once, but I'd like better than 70% reliability from adding 3 plus 5. What's the best way to do that? What's the best way to be willing to spend three times of resources to uh, get as much reliability as I possibly can? All right, so let's spend a minute on looking at what kinds of systems this would actually be applicable to. So there's lots and lots of systems that need this kind of reliability. MapReduce systems that have lots of individual subtasks. There's uh, any, no, not anything, but most things built using the Globus toolkit um, can, be, can benefit from this kind of work. And then there's a series of Boeing systems. Uh, so these are things like folding at home, SETI at home. All of these systems have lots of individual tasks that can happen in almost arbitrary order. It's not quite arbitrary, but almost arbitrary order. And so anything that has tasks like this that can be repeated multiple times to improve reliability and can be reordered will benefit from my technique. And there's a whole other class of techniques um, that's very different from the ones we normally think about, but they're actually even more important. They're crowdsourcing techniques. Things like recapture or folded, which is a protein folding game which has led to some advances in cancer treatments. Uh, there's software verification techniques out there. There's techniques on involving humans in everyday programs, and things like that. So this is an interesting area because the resources here are even more expensive. The humans are the resources, and they're unreliable. They might even be Byzantine, and they may be trying to break my computation. But because the resources are so expensive, we definitely want to squeeze out as much reliability as we can out of that unreliable channel. But all right, so these are the applications. Let's get back to how I'm actually going to do the reliability. So let's start with something very simple. This is the voting redundancy. This is what happens when I just ask three or five of you to vote on the answer. And for now, we're going to assume that the, we know the average node reliability. Let's say that the node reliability is 70%. So if I ask a single node, I get 70% reliability. Um, and let's say I'm trying to hit a system reliability of 97%. That's my target. So, OK. If I ask three nodes, we can compute the probability that we'll get a reliable answer. Right? And that probability is 1 minus the probability that all three nodes failed, or were Byzantine, uh, minus the probability that two of the nodes failed, and there's three different ways in which that can happen. And so we get an 84% chance probability, 84% confidence in the answer if we ask three nodes and then have them vote. In order to get to 97% reliability, we're going to have to ask 19 nodes. Right? So we have to pay a cost of 19, a factor of 19, in order to get to the desired reliability. Right? So that's our baseline. That's what we're trying to beat. It turns out we can beat that by quite a bit. OK. So let's talk about smart redundancy. Here's a flow chart of how smart redundancy works. It takes a computation and it says, let's assume the best case. Let's assume the best possible thing is going to happen. And if that best thing happens, how many jobs do we need to distribute? I'll, I'll explain this with an example on the next slide. But how many jobs do I need to distribute in the best possible case? OK, so we compute that number. We go and we actually deploy that many computations. And then we find out how close to the best case are we? How close is reality to the best case? And if the reality is the best case, then great. We've achieved our desired reliability. We're done. If it's not, we go back to that step and we say, now we know a little bit more about reality. Let's readjust our expectations. Let's say, how many more jobs do we need to deploy in order to achieve, in, in the now known best case, in order to achieve the desired reliability? So the main idea here is that you only deploy jobs if you definitely know you're going to need them. You never deploy a job if it's possible that it will contribute or maybe it won't contribute. So let's take a look at this with an example. I'm going to need to throw up some numbers here on the right for us to, to use this example. We already know what happens if we ask one node and it returns an answer to us. We are 70% certain in that answer. And what happens if we ask two nodes? If we ask two nodes and they both return the same answer to us, right, so we got two of sort of one answer and zero of the other agreeing answers, then we have an 84% chance uh, of getting the right answer. Right. If we ask three nodes, we're even higher. If we ask three nodes and they all give us the same answer, we're at 93% chance. All right, this is great. But now let's look at some disagreements. What happens if I ask four nodes and three of them give me one answer and another one gives me another answer? Well, that's going to undermine our probability. So you can, look at, you can calculate that probability and you get 84% chance. So let me dive into this formula just a tiny bit. How do you calculate this probability? What you look at is what is a, you look at what's the probability that it's that 70% thing happened three times and the 30% thing happened once divided by that same probability that it's the 70 thing happened three times and 30 happened once times the probability uh, plus the probability that the 30% thing happened three times 
and the 70% thing happened once. So how likely is it that you got three bad nodes and one good node to get this answer? So that's how you can compute this. Let me throw out some more numbers here. If you ask four nodes and they all give you the agreeing answer, then you're in this uh, magical 97% reliability that you wanted. Right? So this is the best case. We'll come back to this. If you asked five and, and you got a 4-1 split, then we're back down to 93%. 5-1 also happens to give us this 97% reliability. OK, so let's, we're just going to use these numbers to try to figure out how this technique is going to work. So let me throw back up this uh, flow chart that we saw before. So the first thing we do is we start up here and we say, in the best case, what do we need to do to get the reliability we're looking for? Well, the best case is we deploy four jobs, and they all come back with the same answer, and that gives us 97% reliability. So that's what we'll do. We'll deploy four jobs. That's our best case. Now, we deploy the four jobs, and they go out there. And let's say we get a 3-1 split back. So we weren't in the best possible case. But now we know where we stand. We haven't achieved the desired reliability, so we loop back around, and we say, given the fact that we've seen three of one answer and one of another answer, how many more jobs do we need to deploy in the best case? So the best case here is that we'll ask two more nodes. They'll both give us an answer that agrees with the three. And we'll get this 5-1 split that gets us to 97%. So great, let's do that. We'll deploy two more nodes. There it is. We'll deploy two more jobs. And if they come back to us, and let's say in this case we get lucky, we get a 5-1 split, we're done. We've reached the reliability we wanted, the confidence in our answer that we wanted. And we've spent six times the resources rather than 19. Right? Now, of course, this is just an example execution. I'll show you the. Uh, expected value in just a minute. OK, so that's basically how the technique works. So what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to take a quick aside to talk about something interesting. So here, I've been talking about knowing these probabilities, knowing that the network overall is 70% reliable. But it actually turns out that you don't need that. You can run this kind of computation without having any idea how reliable the nodes are. So um, the basic idea, as I said already, with smart redundancy, is that you assume the best case. And you ask the minimum number of nodes. And you only ask more nodes after you learn how much reality differs from the best case. So no one here does it say that you need to actually know how much your confidence is. All you're trying to do is you're trying to improve the confidence as much as possible given some set of resources. So here's how you do that. We're going to play um, a game, a, a fake game, a virtual game. There's going to be two rooms. And what I'm going to do at the end of this, uh, after I describe the rules, is I'm going to ask you guys to vote which room would you rather be in. So in each room, you will get to make a bet, a virtual bet. Right? And so basically, the difference is, do you, want, do you get more information from what you know in room one, or do you get more information from what you know in room two to make this bet? OK, so let me, ask you, uh, let me describe the rooms for you. So in room one, we're going to take a 30-70 bias coin. So it either comes up heads 70% of the time, or it comes up tails 70% of the time, but we don't know which. We just know it's 70-30. And I'm going to flip this coin four times. And I'm going to get four heads and zero tails. And then the bet that you're going to make is whether it's a 70-30 heads-tails or tails-heads coin. So what's the more likely thing? Right? So presumably, you would, you would guess that heads is more likely since we got four and zero. But you have some amount of certainty that that's the case after seeing four flips. Now in room number two, we're going to do something very similar. We're going to take another 70-30 coin. Again, we don't know whether it's heads or tails uh, 70%. We're going to flip it 1,004 times. And we're going to get a 500 of four heads and 500 tails split. And again, you're going to be asked to make a bet, whether it's a 70% heads or 70% tails coin. So let, let's vote. Who would rather be in room number one to make this bet? I'm seeing four hands. OK, good. You guys split up down the middle. Uh, how many, who wants to be in room number two? Nobody wants to be in room number two. Does anyone have any other answers? <laughs> so. so Incredibly unlikely. That room two will only exist in with prob probability one in ten to the hundred to the whatever. I don't that's right. That's right. Probably. Ten to the hundred. <laughs> okay, so room two may not exist, and therefore you don't want to be there. Um, that, that's exactly right. You expect to get a roughly 700, 300 split, uh, but you're getting this really crazy split. So let's take a look at the probability that this is a, a head coin versus a tail coin, a head favoring versus a head favoring coin. You can write down this whole formula. It is. There are a number of different ways that you can pick out 504 out of 1,004 times the fact that it's the 0.7% thing. So it's the heads that uh, happen 504 times and tails that happen 500 times divided by that same probability times flipping it. So it's the heads that was 0.3% of the time. And yet, that came up 504 times. 
and the probability that it was the tails that comes up 70% of the time and yet happened 500 times. Right? So this is a, it's a very small number, uh, as you mentioned. So here's this probability. But we can notice that there's a bunch of things here we can cross out. So all of these guys are the same. So we can cancel them out. And there's a lot of these uh, 300, uh, 0.3s to the 500. Wait. Someone said? 1,004 over 500? It's, uh, this is a binomial coefficient. This is uh, 1,004 okay. choose 500. All right. Yeah. So, so they're symmetric. 1,004 choose 500 is the same as 1,004 choose 504. Yeah. Um, there's also this uh, 0.3 to the 500 that we can get rid of. So there's just four of them left down here. And there's this 0.7 to the 500 that we can get rid of, and we'll have a couple of fours over here. All right, so I made a total mess here. Let me simplify it out. What we get is this formula, which happens to be exactly the probability in room one. Right? So what happened here? I mean, you had a very good intuition, but this intuition is driving us down the, to the wrong decision. The reason is, this room is incredibly unlikely to happen. Right? But given that this room is what happened, when you send out a bunch of answers and you get some responses back, given that the responses you got back, the question is, how likely am I to have gotten more of the right answer than the wrong answer? So it's very unlikely that you'll be in this room. But given that you are in this room, you get exactly as much information out of it as you do from this room. So the key point to take away here, this, is a, this comes from Bayes' theorem. It's actually a pretty direct implication from Bayes' theorem, but it's very counterintuitive. But the implication for our technique here is that as long as you get a same split, remember how the 4-0 split gave us the same confidence as a 5-1 split? It's because that difference was 4. So really, when you're specifying this reliability technique, you can just specify a single number. You can say, get me a difference of 4, or get me a difference of 20. And it's very parallel to this voting technique when you say deploy to 19 nodes and have them vote. Right? That doesn't actually tell you how much confidence you're going to get, how much improvement in confidence you're going to get. All it tells you is how many resources you're going to use. Right? So it's a single parameter that tells you how much improvement in relative terms do you want to get out of it. All right, so let's take a look at how the system actually works. So I'm not going to describe how I built the system, but I built a system. It's built on top of Boink. We took a SAT, um, a SAT at home and we uh, ripped out the re redundancy technique that it uses, which is voting redundancy, and we put in our own smart redundancy. So what I did here is I took a system, and I varied the reliability of the underlying nodes. Uh, this is, again, deployed on top of Planet Lab. I varied the reliability uh, of the underlying nodes from 0.95, uh, so 95% down to 75%. And then I deployed voting redundancy, uh, Boeing with voting redundancy on top of it. And you see the voting redundancy asks seven nodes each time. And then I also use smart redundancy with um, a difference of two. So I'm trying, just trying to get a difference of two between one answer and the other answer. And what you see is that when the nodes are very reliable, you're getting down to almost two. Sometimes you're still getting unlucky and you get disagreement, you have to ask extra. But you're getting down to almost a cost of two. And then when the nodes become less reliable down here, you're shooting up in the cost that you're spending. And what's interesting here is that the technique automatically adjusts. You're never specifying, oh, the nodes are unreliable, you should do something different. It's just that you're getting more disagreement. The answers are coming back, you disagree more often, and so your cost shoots up. But if you look at the reliability of the overall system, with voting redundancy, the reliability drops, just like the reliability of the underlying uh, nodes drops quite a bit. But with smart redundancy, you're staying, uh, the scales are different, by the way, so watch out for that one. Um, but the smart redundancy, the reliability is staying pretty constant. And in fact, the only reason that there's this jiggle here is because of the discreteness of the system. You can't ask 3.2 nodes that you really want to ask. You have to ask either three or four nodes. And so you're getting these little jumps here from time to time. So that's the goal, to try to keep the reliability of the system at a particular level, regardless of what the underlying hardware is doing, and then use the resources optimally so they use the least possible resources in order to achieve that reliability. So you can actually show that was one example. That was uh, a particular change. You can show that for any desired system reliability, smart redundancy will always outperform voting redundancy. And this graph I'm showing you here is theoretical results. This is mathematically what should happen. I did the same thing using discrete event simulation. And you can see that it's the same graphs. And then I did the same thing uh, empirically using an actual uh, three sat, not three sat, sorry, sat solver on top of Boink. Uh, and you can see that it's a little jumpier. In fact, it's only jumpier for voting redundancy. But you're getting the same results. Yeah? Uh, I think I may have missed something. Smart redundancy uh, makes an assumption about what the actual load reliability is, right? It, it doesn't. It doesn't need to do that. So, so it can. 
uh, you just specify a parameter for how much more reliable in some relative term. So, how does this compute that as formulas for 0.7 or whatever? Mm. Uh, so, how does it compute that if it doesn't know 0.7 isn't 0.8? Right, so, so that's a good question. So um, I didn't quite go over that. So you specify, what, what do you do with voting redundancy? You say ask 19 nodes or something like that. So with smart redundancy, you say get me a difference of answers of two or get me a difference of answers of four. And so smart redundancy goes out and it asks four nodes and if it comes back as a 3-1 split, it says, oh, I need more. So it doesn't actually know what the reliability of the underlying nodes are. It's just trying to get a difference of four. Right? It's, a we it's a weird thing to specify, but I would argue that it's just as weird to specify this 19, because you're specifying the cost you're willing to spend rather than the reliability you want out of it. We could go invert that formula. Invert that formula, a difference of four is effectively equivalent to impl an implied node reliability of, I don't know, it would be some number like it's, or... it's, it's not It's not quite that. The, a four means a relative improvement. If I gave you nodes that are 60% reliable, you'd go from 60 to 82. If I gave you nodes that are 80% reliable, you'd go from 80 to 97 or something like that. Right? So it, it's an amount of improvement. Just like the K for voting redundancy is an amount of improvement. Okay. All right, so uh, you know, these graphs, um, I don't think that they're that interesting. They're really just here to emphasize that the theoretical analysis is consistent with the empirical results. The system that we've built, it actually provides you the same level of reliability as theoretically predicted. Okay, but there is, you know, I've talked about lots of good things about smart redundancy. They're not all good. There is a cost that you pay with smart redundancy, and that is with voting redundancy, I get to go and deploy 19 jobs all at once, and they take some time to come back, but roughly speaking, I get one time unit uh, of, until I get my results. With smart redundancy, you can't do that. You have to deploy your, uh, some number of results, uh, some number of um, tasks, and then you have to wait for them to come back before you decide if you want to deploy more and more. And so it grows uh, logarithmically in the number of steps, in number of um, stages. But if your, uh, your job is one that the, the t you can't move on to the next task until you finish with the task, then smart redundancy may actually cost you more in resources than, well, not in resources, but in time, uh, than voting redundancy would. So for some, for a large number of tasks, lots of uh, recapture tasks, uh, out, um, crowdsourcing tasks, lots of MapReduce tasks where you can do things out of order, it can be helpful and you can get all the benefits, but it's not always better. So there are some situations where it's not always better. All right, so there's two different kinds of related work. Um, there's one kind is other types of redundancy techniques. And for the most part, what I found is that these types of techniques work really well uh, in models where there's random faults, or in models where there's a particular kind of faults. But what I'm really going after is Byzantine faults where somebody's compromising my cloud. And so things like credibility-based fault tolerance that watches the system for a while and says, this node has never given me the wrong answer, they don't work there because a malicious agent might give you the right answer for a long time just to screw you, screw you at just the wrong time. Right? So those kinds of techniques fail on the Byzantine models, whereas smart redundancy does not. And then there's also a number of techniques that are complementary to our work. So things like primary backup and active replication, these use redundancy. And so you can plug in smart redundancy to tell the system how many backups you need in order to achieve a certain level of reliability, things like that. So you can actually improve those kinds of systems. All right, so when we talked about a smart redundancy, I basically showed you how you can use this idea of a computational channel to try to boost optimally, in some sense, the reliability of your system. And there's lots of future work. Uh, what I've talked about today deals with essentially one-bit channels. I get to ask you a computation, and I get an answer back. And it's either right or it's wrong. Uh, and I grouped all the wrong ones together. But you can actually get a lot more if you allow these, comput uh, these communication computational channels to be larger width. So in particular, if I'm allowed to deploy four jobs to Tom, and I have some reason to believe that he's either going to give me the right answer or the wrong answer for all of them, then now I can try to squeeze even more reliability out of that channel. So my uh, proof, I didn't show you the proof today, it's in the paper, but the proof of optimality assumes that there's a one-bit channel. If you're allowed to send multiple jobs to a node and assume correlation between their answers, you can actually be even more optimal, you know, even more reliability out. Uh, there's also lots of things can be done with using the history to improve. So now we're assuming non-Byzantine models, but you can be even better at using the resources. Um, and then also there's lots of applications to crowdsourcing that might have a lot of serious challenges that we may not have thought about before with, it, with the computers because people may work together in different ways and people, the errors may be correlated and things like that. Are there any questions? 
I made you guys uh, answer questions. It's only fair. <laughs> So is there a way to combine these two into like the ultimate private and reliable use of resources? Right. So, so the question is, can you combine uh, style and uh, smart redundancy? In fact, smart redundancy fell out of style. When I was working on style and I was uh, dealing with Planet Lab, some of the nodes were faulty. And I was trying to figure out how would I use the Planet Lab nodes in a smarter way so that when somebody returns a faulty result to me, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. And uh, so the first, the first answer was voting redundancy, but it's very inefficient. So yeah, it, it, this came out of thinking of how would you do reliability, do redundancy in a smarter way. Um, I haven't combined them yet, but it definitely plugs right in, and it's possible to do that. Uh, but I think that this has much uh, broader applications than just for style. Right. Yes? That's right. Have you looked at all of that? If the attacker just wants to retrieve half the output? Yeah, so that's a good question. The question uh, is about if somebody is just trying to get half of your data or some a fraction of your data, how hard is it? So the, the numbers I've shown you, the, the big drop off and then the concrete numbers, had to do with trying to reconstruct the whole input. And you're exactly right. If somebody's trying to come up with just half of the input, what would happen is you would shift down in that scale. You still get an exponential drop off but it's still very hard to get any, constant, uh, sorry, any fraction of your input. What's easy is to reconstruct, say, four bits of your input, or, or one, one bit is very easy. But it's actually getting one bit of the input is a, is a funny thing. So you know that there's a zero somewhere in input. That's actually less than one bit of information, right? One bit of information is to know there's a zero in a particular spot. To know there's a zero is almost no information, right? You just know it's not the old one input. So, um, but if you're trying to get a constant piece, like five bits, it's relatively easier. You don't get the exponential drop off. It's, you get some privacy, but it's possible. If you're looking at fractions of the input, then you get this fast exponential drop off, and it's very hard to reconstruct them. Yeah, so I, I've thought about how, different ways to encode the input. Um, I haven't done a lot of work in figuring out if there's a more efficient way so that really when you reconstruct these chunks, you really can't get much information out. Uh, you know, one very simple thing you could do is if you ensure that the old zero and the old one input uh, aren't legal, then when you find out when there's a one or a zero somewhere in there, you, do, you get nothing. You get literally no information. You already knew that the input can't be all ones. Um, so that's a very simple encoding. But yeah, I think there's a lot of room there for thinking about how do you encode the, uh, the input in such a way that it's still computable upon but uh, you get less information out from reconstructing chunks of it. Okay? Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>